hopefully the, the, the microphone receiver over there on and not complaining. Because there's, there's all kinds of there's wireless things moving every which way in this room. Uh, okay, so uh, in case you didn't notice, we're going to be mic'd up for today in our next uh, lecture. Your instructor had vocal cord surgery and has been instructed to be very calm, which is hard to do when you talk about texture mapping. Um, <laughs> Because it's a really cool topic, but I'm going to try. And we're going to have a nice, uh, calm lecture, which, which works out because I think David's lecture on, on Tuesday was also relatively calm. He's a calm guy. Uh, so in any event, uh, let's see, in terms of our, our course announcements, all that good stuff, nobody was in my office hours yesterday, so I'm assuming that you're all done with your assignment, uh, which is great. Um, there was one really cool assignment with the articulated deforming guy that was like colored. And, who was that? Yeah, your sound was really cool. Uh, <laughs> in any event, um, I always like looking at the, the nice screenshots that we see from people's uh, extra credit. Uh, and usually the ray trace is a good excuse for that. Um, in any event, remember that your quiz is coming up when? I'm asking because I don't remember. November 14th? Whatever is on the course calendar. Do not quote me today. Uh, so remember that and continue to remind your instructor so that he remembers to write an exam. Um, and uh, other than that, your, your course project proposals are due roughly at the same time. Any uh, questions logistically before we get started for the day? All right, so let's talk about texture mapping and shaders. So, so far, we, we've talked about ray tracing first in the world's most boring scenario, where the only surfaces we knew how to render were Lambertian, right? The only thing we could do is compute dot products. And then in our previous lecture, uh, Essentially, David talked a lot about this idea of a BRDF, right? And this is complicated looking. I mean, there's a lot of words that go into defining the acronym BRDF. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Going once, going twice. You're close until the yeah, yeah, there you go, function. Um, that's right, the, the bidirectional reflectance distribution function. Which is a fancy phrase for just saying like, given the amount of light that comes in here, how does that light bounce off of the surface, right? And so David used this phrase distribution over the sphere a lot last time. All he's saying is that if you put like a little ball around that point where your ray ran into the surface, right, there's some amount of light energy that came in, and then there's light energy that disperses out in a bunch of different directions, right? And the BRDF is this function of in and out, and it's basically just giving you a fraction of how much stuff comes out in each direction given the direction that it came in. Right? So that's all that's going on. So from our last lecture, we got a bit of an upgrade, right? Our teapots are no longer just matte terracotta teapots, but they can now be shiny teapots. That's a start. But there is still just one color and one material, right? And so our, our, our task for today is to incorporate textures, which really I think are, are one of the sort of big steps in making a graphics pipeline interesting. Right? Uh, and, and, and so that's what we're up to now. Of course, BRDFs are really complicated objects. Like here's a pair of uh, rendered and, and uh, photographed uh, characters from the matrix. Um, I'm realizing now in my example, I can't tell the difference between them, but it's largely because they're just really pixelated. Um, but if, if you trust me, one of these is rendered and one of them is not. But the basic point that you should take away here is that um, obviously agent Scully or whoever this guy is, like his, his BRDF is not constant, right? I mean, his skin reflects uh, light very differently from his suit, from his shirt, from his sunglasses and his hair, all that good stuff, right? And so typically your BRDF is not just one thing associated with the surface, but rather it can vary from point to point. And that's actually kind of okay, right? Because when we do the, the lighting calculation, what do we do? We, we hit the ray into the surface, and then right at that point, we do our computation of the color. And there's nothing that really cares whether that BRDF that I use at that point has anything to do with the BRDF somewhere else. Right? So just like I can make color and everything else vary along the surface, I can actually make the reflectance model vary along the surface, and it really doesn't change the computational model all that much. Does that make sense? And so the, essentially our task for today is how can we store and manipulate texture, which is going to be like a spatially varying BRDF, which is fancy sounding phrase for something not too complicated um, uh, in, in a sort of an efficient fashion, right? And so that's basically what we're after uh, today is that, you know, this teapot is, is super cool, but we'd really like this double layered teapot with blue and white and, and shiny and not shiny stuff on it. And we haven't quite gotten there yet. Or this cheetah, which presumably has complicated textures on it. 
Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so that's our task today, is essentially just to allow BRDF parameters to vary over space, and that's going to really step up our game in terms of like the, the visual quality of the type of, of images that we can render. Um, one thing to notice, by the way, a lot of today when we talk about texture mapping, you're just going to see color varying along a surface. And certainly, that's the most common style of texture mapping. But it's not the only one. Um, so for instance, remember in this Fong model, we had things like you know, the exponent and the specular highlight component and so on. All of these things can be functions of where you are on a surface. And that's a pretty reasonable setup, right? Like if I have a surface and I paint material on it in kind of a non-uniform way, where the paint is, it's just going to have a different PRDF than everywhere else. And I can store any of that information that I want in a texture map, which we'll define in a little bit. And that's perfectly fine. And it's not going to affect our computation at all. OK, so we're going to talk about two approaches today, or maybe one, depending on, on timing, because I'm calm and speaking slowly. Uh, the first one uh, will be sort of the data-oriented approach to texturing, um, which we're going to uh, talk about something called texture mapping, which is a topic that's very close to my heart, uh, which essentially what we're going to do is to say, in some sense, our, our geometric representation in this course, whether it's like a subdivision surface, triangles, whatever, it's pretty coarse, right? And, and we've already seen that. Like on your assignment, you can see the triangles on your meshes. It's not like they're super detailed. Um, so a very typical thing to do is to store very high frequency information as just like a 2D image, because we're really good at compressing photographs, and then store a map from your triangle mesh into that image so that you read the texture off of that image back onto the 3D shape. That's called texture mapping. So it looks kind of like this. So here, like, we've got this 3D bunny, and we chop him into pieces and then glue him onto the plane, which we're going to do a lot of today. And then now we can store a very high frequency image down here. Your graphics card is really good at computations that happen on a grid, right? So because your image is stored in this nice space, um, we can do all kinds of nice computations down there that would be difficult to do on the 3D surface. Right? Like, even just storing a detailed texture on a 3D surface is kind of a tricky matter. Um, then the other thing we'll talk about is procedural texturing. So do you guys remember what the difference was between like procedural and, and, and other types of, of modeling? We talked about it in the physics uh, uh, portion of our, our course a little bit. Yeah? I mean, procedural means that you like generate it using some sort of shader or some sort of shader. Exactly. So like a procedural shader would do something like, I do my ray tracer, I run it into my surface, and now, like, I know the XYZ coordinate of where my ray hit the surface, and now maybe I do some other calculation involving that coordinate to, like, make up a BRDF at that point. You know, like, the X coordinate squared is going to give me the red component or something. So that would be an example of a very stupid procedural shader. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about um, procedural rendering, in particular one model which is very popular, um, whose name I just forgot. Uh, <laughs> A uh, Perlin noise, uh, which is what generates these sort of uh, low frequency but noisy looking textures that you see here, um, which is a pretty common technique in, in graphics where you like compose together noise at different sort of scales to make interesting uh, things. And, and the kind of amazing thing that, that, that Perlin noticed is that by composing in these clever ways, you can get materials that look an awful lot like usually marble. <laughs> that tends to be the example we see a lot in this area. Um, clouds, like kind of noisy, blurry things. <laughs> Okay, I don't think it's too hard to convince you guys that textures are really important. <laughs> um, here's a rhinoceros with uh, geometry and then shading. Obviously shading adds a lot of detail. Um, and then texture is what's allowing that rhinoceros to have all the little disgusting hairs on it that we all know and love. Um, and, and the basic issue here is that storing each one of those little texture features, like if you look over his, uh, his uh, schnoz here, there's all kinds of little high frequency detail going on here. The only way we know how to represent that so far is with one color per vertex. I need a ton of vertices to store that kind of texture, right? And that's what's, what's going to sort of lead us to like, is that really necessary? Yeah. And, and in particular, one thing to notice is that his geometry here looks smooth, but his texture is varying very quickly, right? And so we'd like to kind of orthogonalize those two directions. And the basic sort of analogy to have in mind here is just nothing more than just kind of wallpapering. So what we're going to do is store a wallpaper texture, like a photograph file, like a JPEG, like what you're used to storing on your phone. And then we're going to store a way to map that thing onto this curved surface that we can, we can render in a nice way. OK. So let's do that. So that's uh, this idea. The, the key phrase for today is something called texture mapping. 
which goes from a 3D model uh, to a texture mapped model. And the way that we're going to do that is via a two dimensional image. Right? And so in order to do that, we're going to decorate our triangle mesh with a little bit of additional information. Namely, for every vertex on our mesh, we're going to store five coordinates. All right, so three of the coordinates are going to be in 3D, like the position, you know, like this, this object. And then we're going to store an additional two coordinates, which are in this image here. Does that make sense? So how could I get, so let's say that I have three vertices of my triangle mesh. And now I want to render a pixel in the inside of a triangle. What machinery do you think I'm going to use? Very centric coordinates. That's exactly right. Sorry, I was too excited there. Very centric coordinates. Um, so the basic point here is that if I have a weighted average of positions in 3D, I'm going to use the same weights in this space down here and then read off a pixel color down there. Now there's one detail that we're going to have to cope with, um, which is really, really critical. Um, what's one notable thing about, that, that happened to the bunny when I mapped it into the plane? <laughs> I had to take scissors to the bunny and, and chop him up into a bunch of pieces. Yeah? And this is a necessary fact. Do you see that? This is a fact about topology, right? Your bunny is a sphere. You might not know it, but it is, right? If I inflated him, you'd make a, a ball. I don't think you'd appreciate it. Uh, but in any event, the plane is not a sphere, right? So necessarily any map that maps from the bunny into the plane is going to have to cut. Seems reasonable enough. But there's like a little bit of a trivia fact that's worth noting, which is, remember so far you guys have written an OBJ loader for your, your triangle meshes? And like, remember what the OBJ format does. Like this vertex here, he has a position, and then he's involved in like one, two, three, four, five, six different triangles, right? So there's a list of vertices, and then there's a list of, of vertex positions, and then there's a list of, of, of triangles that are linking those vertices together. Is that going to make sense for texture maps? The answer is actually no. And the reason is that along a cut, the same triangle is going to want to get mapped to two very different places in space. Right? So it could be that I have like two adjacent triangles in 3D, right? This is in R3, right? And in our texture map, these actually get mapped to just two disjoint triangles. In, in completely different places, right? And, and so in other words, they're going to kind of unglue along this edge, right? So let's say that I have my, my mesh, and he has V vertices, E edges, and T triangles, right? So let's, let's, let's do a little bit of counting. Um, how much data do I need to store to store the 3D geometry? Uh, maybe, but there's a simpler expression for it. I think, think simpler than that. So if I want to store all the vertex positions, the vertex positions are where? They're in 3D, right? So I need for, to store my geometry, I need 3V numbers, right? X, Y, Z for every vertex. I'm not saying anything profound. Like, you guys already know this. You, you, when you wrote your, your OBJ loader, this is what you did. <laughs> um, the point here is that when I want to store my texture coordinates, what information am I going to need? Well, now, like, think about this vertex. He has two different positions, right? One in this triangle and one in that triangle, because I had to unglue that triangle. Yeah? So in some sense, what have I done? Every triangle now no longer communicates with every other triangle. Careful. So how many, so how many triangle vertices are there? There are 3T, right? Because there's T triangles times three vertices. Each of those has a position in 3D. So the total amount of data I need is 9T. Close. Gotcha. OK. Um, so hopefully, I should pause here and see if you guys have any questions. The basic point here is that when I store texture coordinates, I typically do it per vertex per triangle. But when I store 3D positions, I just do it once per vertex because they're all glued together in a nice way. Yes? So in the in the example that you just made, like the I guess, right along the Uh-huh. 
That's a good question. Yeah, implicitly, I, I made an assumption, which is that I, 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 I cut my surface right along the edges of the mesh. That's typically true. Um, you're actually anticipating a sort of a modern question in the literature, which is if I want a piece of software that takes that 3D bunny and automatically produces this, I'm going to get a very jagged cut if I do that. Right? Um, and there's a question, which is, like, is that really desirable output for one of these methods? And I think the, the jury's still out on that one. Yeah, it's a good question. Any others? Cool. All right. So the, uh, the technical term we often use for texture coordinates, uh, artists, for some reason, really like this, which is funny because it's kind of math language. They call them UV coordinates. Have you ever played with like Maya or something? I think they call it like UV coordinate designer. Um, essentially, the point is like XYZ is the position in 3D, and then UV are the positions in the texture plane. Right? And so when I want to texture a triangle, what am I going to do? Well, I have my triangle in 3D. If I want to texture a point here, just as Darius suggests, I can write the barycentric coordinates of that point. Now, this triangle, he has like a little bizarro universe triangle in the plane, right, with different x, y coordinates. But it could be completely different. Like, notice that this one is like flipped upside down from that guy over there. So what do I do? I compute the analog of this orange point here by just reusing the same barycentric coordinates. And now when I want to color this point in 3D, I read off the color from this 2D texture, and that's what I use for the 3D triangle. This is like one of those sentences that sounds really annoying when I articulate it, but I think it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> you get that? So basically, there are two different triangles at play. There's the one in 3D and the one in the plane, and they coordinate, they coordinate with each other via a uh, barycentric coordinate. Okay? Uh, and, and, and so really, that's, that's what this, this rendering kind of algorithm is going to do. Um, this uh, technique has a name. This is called a texture lookup. Right? So the basic idea is that I'm like rendering a 3D model of your hand. We've already talked about how to like intersect rays with different triangles. You okay? Okay. Um, right, so I get, I get a point on a triangle here. And now that triangle has some triangle in my texture map. And I use the same barycentric coordinates over here to get the texture coordinate. I read off the color and that's the color I'll use in, in 3D. Yeah. That's right. So, like, wouldn't using the same barycentric coordinates have to be, like, I don't know, different? Like, You're right. So, what'll happen is, like, this, like, let's say that I get really close up on this hand, this triangle will expand, right? So, you're right. The, the barycentric coordinates here will change, but the position in this image will remain uh, kind of the same under the assumption that your texture is attached in a barycentric fashion. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? Cool. Any ideas what can go wrong, by the way, with this, this kind of strategy? This image is actually a great example. So, so let's say the, I mean, this is a very good hand texture. It's a little bit gross. I don't like looking at it. Um, and now, let's say that I want to render my hand, but I want to render my hand on the other side of the room. Okay? So, like, if this is the position of one pixel, <laughs> in my rendered image, where's like probably the position of the next one? Probably like pretty far away, right? Because the hand is pretty far, right? It's taking a very small part of my image. What's going to happen over here? Like where's my next sample going to be? Like a completely different place, somewhere like way over here. But notice that this image of the hand has very high frequency texture, right? Like some places are white, some of them are, are kind of yellowish. So what is that going to look like when I render? <laughs> noise. <laughs> yeah. It's just going to look like a random mess, right? Because if I had just gotten my position slightly different over here, I'd get a completely different color. Right? So we're going to return to that later when we talk about Fourier theory. Essentially what we need is a nice filter that blurs out this image before we do our texture map. Okay. So let's see how this is uh, compatible with the ray casting algorithm. So remember, uh, what, do, what does our ray casting do? We've got our eyeball, we've got our computer screen, send a ray through our eyeball into the computer screen, out into the world, and we figure out what triangle it hits into. Once we do that, we can figure out the barycentric coordinates of that hit point in that triangle. Now, we use those same barycentric coordinates down here to read off the color, right? And so this is just a simple extension of the ray casting algorithm that you guys already have. Does that make sense so far? Like you could all go home and code that? 
Yes. Ah, yeah, that's a great question. What is the probability of the ray from your eyeball hitting onto exactly an edge? I, I mean, just like even, like I don't, if you're in a triangle that has one of the points that are one of like the duplicate points, how do you know which coordinate, which UV coordinate that's stored in that point? Ah, that's a great question. So this has to do with sort of your data structure for storing a triangle mesh. Right? So remember that so far we have this list of vertex positions, then we have this list of triangles, right? and the triangles kind of point into the vertex positions. Where should the texture coordinates be stored? They should be stored in the triangles, right? Like vertex 1, vertex 2, vertex 3, vertex 1, vertex 2, vertex 3, on two adjacent triangles. So there's, as you say, there's, there's no ambiguity. Yeah. Otherwise you'd be in a lot of trouble, because if I stored them per vertex, I'd somehow like have an arbitrary different amount of, of, of UV coordinates depending on which vertex I'm at, which wouldn't be so great. Yeah, great question. Any other? Cool. All right. So we talked about interpolation in one fashion, right, which is like how do I get the texture coordinate in the interior of a triangle? I use barycentric coordinates. Now I do my texture lookup with pretty high probability. Am I going to get an integer for my position? Probably not. I'm going to end up like somewhere like halfway between pixels, right? There's, there's no reason why I should, I should end up right on that, that pixel grid in my, my texture image. So what do I need to do? I need to interpolate, right? Um, and there are many ways to do that. I hear linear interpolation over here. That's actually one of several. Um, that's the one we'll start with today. And then when we talk about Fourier theory, we'll see that there are better interpolations out there. Um, so the, the basic issue here is that like here are my pixel colors, right? I can think of them as sitting on a grid. When I do my ray tracing, I want the color at like, you know, position 0 0.75, 0 0.25, or whatever this point is. I need a fashion of reading off that color. Uh, so there are many strategies to do that. Uh, one of them would be to just round. What's my rendered image going to look like? Yeah, I'm going to see the pixel grid, right? Like if I render my hand like that and my texture is uh, kind of low frequency, I'm going to see all the little squares in my, my, uh, my rendered, rather my texture map. So, as we suggest over here, uh, a slightly smoother approach is to use something called bilinear interpolation. Exactly what it sounds like, uh, which is that we're going to do linear interpolation twice. Yeah? Uh, so, in particular, uh, one thing we could do is, so let's say we wanted the color at like a point somewhere over here. Well, I could look on, the, I could say, uh, let's first just look at these two points, right, on the two sides at the same y coordinate and interpolate linearly in that direction first. We know how to interpolate linearly. We've talked about that before. Oops, I'm sorry. I actually I flipped it sideways. Yeah. So in other words, we're going to interpolate linearly along the bottom and the top. It's obviously symmetric. And now what can I do? I can connect those with a line and interpolate linearly again. And that'll get me my pixel color. You guys can work out that formula pretty easily, I think. Um, there's one suspicious thing about the way that I derived this formula, which is I did it in X and then in Y. The skeptics among you should ask, but like, what if I did it in Y and then and then in X? Right? It would be there would be something wrong with the universe if my interpolation method were somehow biased toward one direction or the other. Um, one thing you can double check is that you'll get the same formula for both. Um, so even though conceptually that's how we derived it, it actually doesn't matter. Okay, so this is bilinear interpolation strategy, and it's nice because when I zoom into this pixel grid, I don't see walls between pixels. However, however, I am likely to see the pixel grid, right? Like I'm just going to see little linear artifacts instead of discontinuities, right? And so what we'll talk about later is that it actually may make sense to take a larger neighborhood when you do that interpolation. Um, and there, there's actually a nice sort of Fourier reason that explains uh, 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 that story. Every year I get a budget of one lecture to teach all of sampling and reconstruction theory, which is an interesting challenge, and every year I fail, uh, but we're going to try again this year. Okay, so like we already talked about, um, there's kind of an interesting issue with texture mapping, which is a little bit counterintuitive, right? Like typically we're always happy when we have more data, right? Like we want, we want big data, and one way to do that might be to store a really, really detailed texture for every object in our scene, and somehow that's order one lookup. Like the, the algorithm that I need here doesn't like iterate over all the pixels in the image, right? Like it, it, it takes just as much time for me to do texture lookup on a big image as it does on a small one. But the problem isn't time complexity, it's 
is sort of texture complexity, right? That like here are maybe two adjacent pixels in this small image of a hand, and because I have such a detailed texture map, they end up really, really far apart. And essentially, there's so much high frequency stuff going on in between. The colors at these two points are essentially random, right? Um, so for now, we'll talk about one sort of heuristic way to fix that issue, um, which is clever. This is something called a MIP map. Has anybody used or played with MIP maps before? Cool. Um, so this stands for Multum in Parvo. I don't know what cute computer science researcher decided to use Latin this time. Um, the basic idea here is that, you know, in a typical texture map, what do I store? I just store my image. But one thing I could do just before loading my 3D scene, so like I haven't rendered a, a damn thing yet, is I could say, okay, I'm going to take my, my 3D, my texture image, and I'm going to divide it in half. Okay, how could I do that? I could just take every four pixels and just average them and make an image that's half as wide and half as tall. And then what could I do to that image? Divide it in half again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, right? And a MIP map does a really clever thing. It just says, okay, rather than just storing that one giant texture, I'm going to store that giant texture plus a second texture that's half as big, plus a third texture which is a quarter as big, plus a fourth texture that's an eighth as big, and so on. First of all, when should I stop? Like how many MIP map levels should I make? This is right, like, and, and, and somehow when it's smaller than a pixel, it's not clear how I could store it anyway. You know? so, Should I stop before that? Does it actually matter all that much? Like, that's extra space, right? I'm, 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 I'm wasting space on my GPU. The answer is actually no. And here, here's the, 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 the trick. So in particular, let's assume that my image width happens to be a power of two, just to make my life a little easier. Okay. By the way, old graphics cards typically uh, do this. They just... Your texture map has to be like 128 or 256. So let's say that I have one is like the size of my image. So then what's the size of uh, the next level of my mint map? Well, it's half as wide and half as tall. So it's like one fourth. So that's my extra space for storing the next level. What's the next, uh, exactly, 1 16th, because it's half as big and half as wide as this guy. What is this number? I don't know. You got it. Yeah, so I don't know what this number is because I'm bad at math, but I do know it's less than 2. <laughs> Even if I continue this sum out to infinity, right? So what is that telling us about our mid-map? What it's telling us is that I can store all of these different levels, which I just compute off, offline before I, I, by, I even render a, a single pixel, and I only incur a factor of storage of two. Like, I don't actually like, use up infinite more memory, even if I want mid map levels that are at the scale of one pixel, which is kind of clever. Moreover, uh, people came up with really smart ways to store these things. So notice the way these images are laid out, right? Where what I did is I put the next mid map level up and to the right, and down to the left and so on, so I can even kind of tuck them together in a way that, that doesn't increase the storage a whole lot. If you're really good, you take two MIP maps next to each other and then you kind of click them together like that. I, I can never get that to work, right? Um, so the basic point here is that with constant factor in the amount of storage, you can get images that are essentially just shrunken down versions of your original texture it somehow seems the opposite of what we want to do, right? Like, usually we want to add detail, but here I'm telling you to blur stuff out. So what should I do when I'm rendering if I have this mint map? Like, what texture coordinate should I use? Like, now I have one triangle here, I've got another triangle here, another triangle here, another one, so on, right? Like, I've got a lot of different triangles to choose from. Yeah. Exactly. So like you say, like, well, I know the spacing between pixels on my computer screen. So that tells me the spacing between samples in my texture map. And what do I want? I want that spacing to be roughly one pixel in the texture map, right? Because that's the resolution where they agree. So there's essentially a bunch of heuristics out there for choosing the right level so that the distance between pixels in your screen is roughly the distance between pixels in your texture map, which is what you want. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's absolutely right. So you, uh, like we, we pointed out here, distance to the camera won't do it, right? So for instance, if I look askance at the surface here, right, then, then somehow as I move uh, farther out, there are certain stretch factors that have to do with not just distance, but also the orientation of the surface, right? So typically your mip map level uh, depends on at least two things. One is the distance to the camera, the other is the normal to the surface because right, that's kind of telling you the expansion factor that's going on there. So we'll talk about that a little bit more when we, when we discuss sampling. We're sort of lacking the right math to do that now. Yeah? So I see how this could work in like making things, I don't know, look, make a little more sense when they're far away. Uh -huh. Does this actually improve like visual quality for like nearby objects? Yes. Oh, for nearby objects, no. For, this is for far by, far, far by, far away, <laughs> distant <laughs> objects. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're absolutely right. That's right. So there's two different issues that come into play when we talk about texture mapping, right? There's minimization and maximization, right? So when I get really close to a surface, there's a different issue, which is that my texture map just isn't good enough. It doesn't have enough detail. And then so there's only so much I can do, right? Like I'm just missing information. Um, so I can interpolate and I can try to come up with ways that make it look smoother. But fundamentally, I've, I'm using up all the information I have. The issue is when things start to move far away, I have a lot of information, but I'm misusing it in a way that's actually adding noise to the image. So that's what mipmaps are intended to deal with. Now there's a different type of noise that can occur when you use these techniques. It turtles all the way down, right? You fix one problem, another one pops up. Because I have a video game, you know, I'm chasing after Darius, he's running away, he's a much faster runner than I am. And, and so as we, we move, what happens? The distance between us increases, he starts to look smaller, and then suddenly his texture decides, oh, he's far enough away, I should use a different level in the mint map. And suddenly my animation looks discontinuous, right? Like he just became this blocky Darius because he's far away. So what am I going to have to do? You got it. I'm going to have to interpolate in mint map space as well uh, to make sure that that sort of transition is a smooth one. Yeah. We're going to talk about that more in the next couple lectures. Okay. Um, so that's how to render with UV coordinates, but what have I not told you? I haven't told you how to get these things, <laughs> right? Like, uh, given a 3D model, how do I actually map that darn thing into the plane um, in, a, in a reasonable fashion? And there are many different ways. It turns out actually the most common solution is the most boring, which is, it's often, it's kind of amazing, but designed manually. There are actually UV coordinate designers out there in software that a lot of artists will sit there and spend a lot of time like stitching together texture patches and so on. Um, there's more sort of automatic uh, techniques that are coming out year by year. Turns out this is a topic of research that I work on quite a bit, so I'll show you a little bit of what we do. Um, and there's a third one that was popular in the 80s, so it's worth mentioning, um, which are these sort of closed form mathematical formulas you can use uh, for certain types of texture coordinates, but the distortion is going to be really high. Um, so the basic thing that you want when you UV map a surface is you would like to minimize distortion, right? Like when you take that 3D surface, you map it into the plane, what would be really bad is if like some of your triangles take up the entire texture map and then like a million triangles take up just like a tiny piece of it, right? Because somehow your resolution is very non-uniform, right? And so all of these algorithms and techniques, their basic job in life, really should have brought water, uh, is to sort of pack the triangles in a nice, even, isotropic way. Okay, um, right, and so often this is uh, known as sort of UV or texture optimization. The basic idea here is you want to unwrap a 3D surface into 2D coordinates. It's really fascinating. This is a task that typically is assigned to artists, but from my perspective, it's basically a mathematical problem, and then the reason is that we don't know how to solve it. Um, the automatic UV mapping somehow isn't at the level uh, that a lot of people want um, in order to just use these automatic tools out of the box. Although typically there's a little bit of a trade-off, like the, the artist will do the cutting and the computer will do the parameterization or something like that. Um, here's a very typical looking sort of user interface for UV mapping where the artist will design a 3D model and then literally it will just give them like a pair of scissors and you chop this thing. And then what the artist can do is place points on the boundary of that little scissored model in the plane. And then it's not too hard actually using linear algebra to place the vertices in the interior of a patch in a kind of reasonable uh, fashion. If you like these sorts of problems, you should take my graduate course, 6838, cover a lot of these different methods. And these are ongoing research problems in, in computer science. So like for instance, here's an image from one of our, our recent uh, papers. For those of you who have taken a machine learning course, 
you learn a lot about large scale optimization. Right? You, typically in learning, it's about the weights of a neural network or something like that. This is another great example of a large scale optimization problem. So even after I take scissors to my cow here, right, so I'm not even worried about the topological issue, I just want to smash them into the plane, it's, it's less violent than it sounds. Um, what's my objective? Well, it's the sum over every triangle of some measure of the distortion of that triangle. And if any two triangles share the same piece of the plane, the entire parameterization is verschlicked, right? Like, because the second they share the same piece of the plane, they get the same texture. That's no good, right? So if you talk about constrained optimization, I have a constraint on every pair of points here, and I have an extremely large scale objective function that I have to optimize, and a single incorrect point is enough for my entire output to be garbage. And that's what makes these problems so hard. Uh, and so there's a lot of cool uh, algorithms out there uh, many of them, including well, a lot of the things coming out of our group, are focused on this latter step of like, somebody took scissors to the cow and now I just want to map them into the plane. That turns out to be the easy part. The harder part is uh, taking a 3D surface and automatically cutting it in a way so that the individual pieces will have low distortion when I map them into the plane. This is a very, very challenging computational problem. There's actually opportunity not just for optimization but machine learning here. So for instance, when you look at an artist parameterizing a surface, they tend to put the cuts in the parameterization like behind the ears and like places where there's hair. Why do they do that? Well, if you zoom in really close, you probably can see that slight discontinuity in your texture map. And so it's not just minimizing distortion, it's also kind of putting it in perceptually <coughs> uninteresting places. Really fascinating stuff. So for instance, for fun, I thought I'd show you guys a video of, of one of our recent tools that, that, that solves this problem. Let's see if it'll actually work. Um, to see the kind of computational techniques. So here's, I think, what's currently state-of-the-art for automatic parameterization. What we're showing you is we have a texture in the plane, which is just these letters and a little grid. And this optimization procedure is trying to unwrap the surface and cut it in such a way that the distortion is low and uniform. Uh, and you can see that, certainly computationally, finding the right cuts and, and so on is an extremely difficult task. And essentially, we're asking artists to, to solve this problem by hand, right? This is just minimized distortion of the map of this guy into that one. Um, I think there's a better example later on. So here's a, an octopus. Um, and we're trying to minimize this distortion. And you can see over here, what it's trying to do is place the cuts along the surface. Of course, there's a trade-off here, right? Which is that I can get a zero distortion parameterization by cutting along every single edge of the triangle mesh, right? In other words, just doing origami, like uncut, gluing this thing to a bunch of triangles and sticking each one into the plane one by one. But that's probably not terribly practical for texture mapping. And so there's a trade-off between the length of the cut and the distortion of the surface that you get. Uh, and it's super, super hard to navigate. I also think that this is mildly terrifying to watch. Um, <coughs> but I digress. Yeah. So anyway. If you like these kinds of problems, there's, these are actually open problems. I mean, one thing that we're hiding in this figure here is this number right there. Right? This is an accelerated video clip. Um, in order to get that parameterization, which I'd argue is good but not perfect, it requires several minutes of computation time, which is why artists just don't have the patience. They, they just do it by hand. And this is state of the art. I mean, this was what, last year. Okay. Right, so all of these algorithms um, for parameterization, they input, what, a, you know, a model, coordinates, and, 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 and what they uh, do is they store uh, lots of different information in the texture plane, not just the color, but also like parameters of the BRDF, um, a texture map, and so on. There are many other methods out there for, for computing UV coordinates. One of the ones that's popular in computer vision has this kind of annoying name because like to me, all these methods are mathematical, but like, it's often called a mathematical or closed form uh, mapping. The idea here would be like, let's say that I want to parameterize a particularly simple surface like a Campbell soup can here. Well, you guys took in pre-calculus class, you probably found some way to trace out the Campbell soup can, like by what, theta and z here. It's a perfectly reasonable parameterization. So if you get lucky, <laughs> then you know, for like cylindrical surfaces, maybe you can just come up with in close form a formula for your, your texture map. I would argue you don't normally get too lucky, although there is one exception, um, which is this idea of projective matching, mapping, where maybe what you do is you kind of like hold a projector up to your 3D surface for a few canonical angles. And you just see what's visible from those different angles. 
right? And the, uh, you just use the texture map in that projector screen uh, as, as, as texture coordinates. Sometimes you kind of use rendering to compute UV coordinates. Um, this is not a terribly effective algorithm because if I look at a surface kind of askance, then the distortion will be very high, right? Because the triangle will be very collapsed in the, the camera plane. Um, but this is uh, still a kind of a reasonable approach. I don't think it's worth going through a lot of details. People in computer vision like it for obvious reasons, which is that if you're trying to reconstruct a 3D model from like video, that's precisely the texture coordinates you have, right? Um, so for instance, here's a kind of funny example of image-based rendering. It's time. Uh, where, 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 it's also very like kind of 1990s looking. Um, it's at Berkeley, which means it's terrible. Uh, that's, uh, I, I used to work at Pixar, which is around the corner from here, and I, I, I stopped by the Berkeley tour at one point, and they, they talk about how like, what is this thing called, like the Campanile or whatever? It's like, you know, the second tallest white brick structure in this side of California or something. It's like the best claim that they can get. But in any event, um, the nice thing about image-based rendering is that once you have these nice texture coordinates, right, you can use this. Basically, your texture now is just a photograph, right? It's a picture you took, plus the geometry of the shape that you have. And you can do clever things like composite that together with whatever your favorite other stuff is that you want to combine inside of your scene. And so this video is a very famous sort of early example where they're just generating new camera views and using, I'm sure in this case, some grad student like very, <laughs> you know, painstakingly entered the geometry of this, this 3D model in order to get this thing to work. So that's kind of fun. It was probably more impressive before like the whole drone thing. Yeah, it was probably more impressive before you could just literally videotape this. Um, <laughs> But I suppose you could have, you know, King Kong crawling up the side of this and it wouldn't be that difficult, which I arguably would still be kind of challenging with the drone. Okay. Um, in terms of texture mapping, that image-based coordinate method is sort of nice if you, like, take a photograph of an object and you just want to use that as your texture. Right? That's what that's for. Uh, the sort of standard algorithm for doing this um, for generic sort of triangle meshes is, is what I show you here. It's called barycentric uh, parameterization. So here, the idea is, what's a pretty good parameterization? Let's say I have one of these pieces of software where I go, I go ahead and I take scissors to someone's face, which is something we do often in graphics, and I get a disk shape, right? just like a round circular object, and I want to put it in the plane. And moreover, my artist specifies the vertex positions on the outside. This is a pretty common thing to do. Like the artist will draw a spline, which we've already talked about, and we'll use that as the outside of our parameterization. What would be really annoying for the artist to do would be to place every single vertex in the interior of the face in the, the texture map, right? So in the barycentric parameterization, we make one additional assumption, or if I'm feeling fancy and I'm writing an academic paper, we call this an ansatz, which is that you can put every vertex in the interior at the average of its neighboring vertices. A really clever trick, okay? So I've got a bunch of, of unknowns in my problem, so now, my unknowns in, in this parameterization problem are uh, what? They're just a bunch of vertex positions, x1 to xv in the plane, right? Giving me the positions of all those, those points in, in the, the texture plane. And in barycentric uh, 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 parameterization, what I'm going to do is that every vertex will be in one of two circumstances. The first circumstance would be I'm on the boundary, in which case what I'll do is just prescribe it. I'm going to assume that the artist has just taken a little pin and stuck the, the vertices on the boundary. And my job is just to fill in the interior. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to make this sort of assumption that interior vertices will have this nice structure, which is if I take a vertex and I look at all of its neighbors, this vertex is right at the center of its neighbors. So in other words, maybe I have x, v is equal to 1 over the neighbor, number of neighbors of v times the sum over w adjacent to v of x, w. Right? So this would be saying that like here's v and here's w. And this is some condition linking v to its neighbor. Does that make sense conceptually? Like this is roughly what this condition is saying is that this vertex is the center of all the guys next to him. 
This is a linear expression in all of the x's. <laughs> you see that? How many expressions are there? There's one for each interior vertex, right? And how many unknowns are there in my problem? Every single interior vertex. So this is basically just a giant matrix acting on my vertex positions that I can invert, and what it'll give me is my, my parameterization. So that's this uh, idea, that I write down this condition at every single vertex in the interior. That's a linear expression involving all my unknowns, which are the v's. Sorry, the x v's here. My apologies. And I get a big matrix, which is vertex by vertex sized. And I invert it, and what comes out are the positions of all the stuff in the inside with the property that every point here is the average of all of its neighbors. It's kind of cool you can do that. Um, there are actually some, some cool theorems here. I know that everybody's excited about cool theorems. Um, in particular, there's one that's really critical, and then I'll shut up and stop talking about theory and we'll go back to, to texture mapping, um, by a guy named Tut. He's a famous graph theorist. And what Tut says is if I solve this linear system of equations, and moreover, the vertices that I've prescribed on the boundary are in a convex shape, like a circle, then necessarily none of my triangles flip over when I solve this linear system of equations. In other words, that issue that I was worried about, where my shape somehow intersects itself, that this cannot happen. And the reason is that this is somehow like a system of springs, right? Like there's a little spring in between every pair of vertices. I'm trying to make it settle down to its resting position. And somehow Tut observed that that spring system will never want a triangle to be kind of inverted. That's a very difficult theorem to prove. But I encourage you to get out some scrap paper and see if you can do it. Yeah? Why, why did we do this? Why did we try and get every point to be the center of the center? Uh, well, uh, in some sense, we, we did this sort of phenomenologically, right? Because we said, like, uh, what's a reasonable parameterization might be to do, uh, to compute something with that property, right? Because if it weren't at the center of his neighbor, somehow you could make the distortion lower by putting it there. Right? And then what Tud proved is that somehow when you do that, you have two advantages. One is it's a linear system of equations. Computationally, it's not so hard. And the other is that you actually can never have a triangle flip over. Like there's a geometric reason to solve this. It's kind of cool. Okay, in any event, let's get back to, to texture mapping. Enough uh, research topics. Okay, so, uh, right. Uh, a few other kind of fun things you should know. Um, if I'm rendering a giant brick building, it would be kind of overkill to probably store like a giant texture, which is just a brick repeating a billion times. So a very typical thing to do is to sort of come up with some rule for wrapping um, with a W. Uh, so that like, you know, if, if I'm, my texture coordinate is outside of the square, maybe I like keep subtracting integers until I'm back into that square. Right? That would be called a parametric or like, periodic boundary condition. Um, there are really clever user interfaces for drawing texture maps where like maybe what I do, you know, like let's say I'm trying to make a texture map for a brick building. So like here's my like texture map interface. So like I, you know, here's my little box where I can start drawing my texture. And a very typical thing to do would be to make a user interface that extends like this. And like when I draw something here, just repeats it with my boundary conditions. So on. Why should I do that? Well, now if I draw a brick like that, it'll just go ahead and fill it in across the top too. So like I can't not draw a nice texture periodically if I have a UI that looks like that, which is pretty nice. It's clever. Okay. One thing to note, remember we talked about, <coughs> anybody remember what this shading model is called? Starts with a P, ends with Hong. <laughs> Fung, yeah, um, and it had like a bunch of different parameters, right? Like the ambient piece, the diffuse part, the specular part, the exponent. We can store all of these numbers in a texture. We don't, like a texture is not just color, right? And, and that's perfectly fine because our shading computation happens per pixel. And so that's what's allowing us, for example, if you want this like kind of cool, frosty piece of metal surface, as, as we all do, there are many in my office. Um, Probably the most efficient way to store this as a piece of geometry is just two triangles, right? Like, there's no reason to like have a billion little triangles to store a flat square, um, but I can have this spatially varying BRDF, the fancy phrase you can use, which is just saying that like my dot product lighting here is different from that one, and I'm just reading all of those different numbers in my Fung model out of different image files. Um, in fact, we can go even farther than that. Um, there are some really clever tricks. 
Notice that the normal vector to our surface is like often really critical in, in how we do our shading, right? I mean, dot products with normals happen all over the place in this computation. We can do one really crazy thing. Um, it turns out your eye is actually quite good at picking up differences in normal vectors. Like if you look at a surface, you can kind of guess its roughness before you feel it, even if that surface, you know, from a macro scale is pretty smooth. Um, so one thing we can do is not only store like texture information in a texture map, we actually store the normal vector direction too while we're at it. Um, this, is, uh, this is called normal mapping. The idea is that we're going to store this thing as a texture as well. Why would I want to do that? Yeah. You could have like a 3D texture on a flat plane. Right. It actually really closely simulates having a surface with just little microscopic details. Um, of course, that'll fall apart, right? If I can look at the surface right at the side, it'll look flat even though the normal is changing a lot. Um, the other thing it allows us to do is compression. So here's a very complicated triangle mesh. It's got four million triangles. There are many algorithms out there that take triangle meshes and simplify them to you know, less complicated ones. So here's a, a 500 triangle version of the same guy. One thing I can do is put those two meshes on top of each other and store a normal map, which is the normals from the dense guy, as a texture on top of the triangle from the sparse one. The reason to do that is that the storage here is much, much smaller, right? It's easy to store a 500 triangle mesh. Um, and now, when I render it using normal mapping, I would argue that there's very, very little difference except maybe right at the facets of this object, which is pretty cool. This is a clever trick. And as you rotate the surface around, you'll see a little bit of effect of the orientation changing. What will you not see is effects like self-shadowing, right? That will not happen in a normal map. Um, and in fact, this is really the standard technique. Um, so often artists will spend just as much time designing the, what we call the diffuse texture, which is fancy phrase for like color, um, as the normal map, the specular components, and so on. Um, and they're stored in giant uh, texture files. There are many ways that you can do that, right? Like you could ask a question, which is what coordinates? Uh, should I be using for the normal? I think a very typical thing to do is to store sort of a perturbation from the triangle normal, right? So like your triangle normal, you still compute per triangle, and then what you store in your normal map is just like an edit to that thing. This is probably better than storing just the X, Y, Z coordinates of the normal itself, because if you took the whole 3D surface and rotated it, the normal would change, right? So, so if you wanted to do that, you would have to um, do a little bit of extra computation. Yeah, so here's a sort of very simple method for generating a normal map, right? You have a detailed mesh, you compute some UV parameterization into, you know, a different domain, and you simplify that detailed mesh, that's like that 500 triangle mesh we saw before, and you use the same UV maps, so you just overlay the two, and you read off the normals of the dense guy in the coarse guy's uh, uh, normal map. Um, so this, this trick makes some sense. It's a really clever way to get extra detail with very little extra cost. So if you read through like, you know, these books with like OpenGL hacks, you'll see that basically what they start doing is storing all kinds of weird things in texture maps uh, that help the rendering process. Like things that you really have no business storing, you know, like normal maps. Um, and, and they really do uh, help things quite a bit. And of course you can mix and match all of these, these tricks, right? Like you can maybe even come up with clever ways to uh, tile and, and combine your normal maps. Um, when you tile, you have to be a little bit careful, right? Because if I tile bricks along a curved object, the normal is obviously changing. So probably when we talk about storing that perturbation, you store it like in the coordinates of the triangle plane, right? So that when you rotate your surface, that doesn't change. Any questions? This is just basically a dirty trick that, that a lot of rendering people use to add detail to a coarse surface. Cool. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about procedural shading. Um, oh, uh, right, so uh, let's see here. Essentially, there's a key vocabulary term that's going to come up a lot in the remainder of our course. This is the term shader. Shaders are a little bit frustrating because the term shader refers to a lot of things that really aren't shading. Um, but in this particular lecture, uh, our shader really is exactly that. So the basic idea, this is, by the way, when you dig through kind of modern research, you see a lot of people talk about like special programming languages for graphics and so on. Shaders were sort of the earliest, well, one of the earliest examples of, of, of this sort of thing. So a shader is a little piece of software that gets run every single time on a light, a surface. 
right? So like a shader would be like a little function that like maybe takes in, you know, the, the parameters, the input light direction, the color of the surface, anything else I need to know, and just outputs, you know, the reflected radiance, like the color that's going to go back to the computer screen. And the idea is that a shader actually gets compiled by your GPU if you're in the rasterization pipeline. And the reason why it's worth doing that is because it gets run a gajillion times, right? Once for every pixel. Sometimes more than once for every pixel if I have a bunch of surfaces that overlap. And so um, now in real-time graphics, essentially all of these different ideas that we're talking about, normal mapping, texture lookups, uh, BRDFs, all these different tricks, are all just implemented in shader code, which is just an abstraction of a thing that gets run once per shaded pixel. Uh, and so originally, historically, these were, were proposed um, in a, a very famous piece of software called RenderMan. This came out of uh, Pixar, although not the animation branch of Pixar. They had like a little software branch and continue to actually. Um, and then they got adapted when uh, graphics card technology got better. And essentially the graphics card became this device whose job in life was just to run shaders really, really, really fast. And so we'll talk about how uh, architectures are designed to do that. Um, when we start talking about hardware, which is a topic that frightens me a lot. Right, and so um, shaders often are, are things, the, the, the objects in your, your graphics card that are doing all the texture mapping, right? Because every single pixel has got to keep doing these lookups. And so these special like hardware architectures where your shader is sitting right next to that piece of memory storing your texture. So that like that, that little lookup into that grid is as fast as possible. A different kind of shader is this procedural texture, right? Because it's just a little program that gets run every time you shade a pixel. It doesn't say you've got to look up a texture in an image, right? It could be that you run a little program that does some computation and gets your color that way. So for instance, uh, here's a very simple shader that, let's say I wanted to shade a checkered floor. How could I do that? I could look at my x and y coordinates, right? And I could just determine whether they're odd or even and use that to compute whether I should be red or yellow, I guess. Do I need to store a giant red, yellow checkerboard as a texture? No, like I can just write a little piece of code that looks at my coordinate and decides what color I should be, right? And so that's an example of a very simple shader that takes in, in this case, your XYZ position and outputs color. Does that make sense? Cool. And so this is the idea of a procedural texture. Here's an example of the same procedural texture in 3D. You can get some really nice high resolution behavior here, right? Like for instance, this like concentric circle texture would actually be kind of annoying to store as an image. Like you'd have to unwrap the cube into the plane. You'd probably need a pretty high frequency or high pixel image to store all these circles here. Or you could just, you know, compute a few coordinates and, 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 and come up with a reasonable way to draw circles. And, and the latter is, is perfectly fine and has the added advantage that if I get all up into this cube's business, the circles still look just as nice as they'd look at a distance, right? Because this is just a closed form kind of formula. Um, so we'll talk about one uh, particular strategy for procedural uh, texturing that's called Perlin noise. This is something called pseudo-random. This is a wishy-washy term, meaning that at some scale it's randomly generated, but of course random noise isn't terribly nice for shading. Um, so Perlin noise actually does a weird thing, which is uses a random gen number generator populates a texture with those random numbers and then uses it for some other computation. But that texture is, is much, much smaller uh, than the actual object you want to, to, to render. Or there, there's some clever tricks for getting rid of that as well. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later. And, and these are, go back to Ken Perlin. He's a professor at NYU, um, also a very famous member of the computer graphics community. I think he got an uh, Academy Award at some point for this uh, particular development. So the basic idea of, of, of Perlin noise is that so many different phenomena in the world are just basically random stuff composed together at like different frequencies. Right? So for instance, like let's say I'm looking at sand dunes. So what are sand dunes? Well, there's like some low frequency kind of random thing, which is the shape of the sand dune. And then maybe there's a little bit of high frequency noise, which is, you know, roughly on the size of, you know, a piece of sand, which is on there. And I can compose those two things together and maybe get like something that's, you know, noisy on a big frequency, normal noisy on a small frequency, and doesn't have anything in between. Right? And so uh, in Perlin noise, the basic idea was to generate lots of images that look like this circle here. Like they're kind of noisy, but kind of blurry but control the width of that blob there very carefully. And then what artists can do is composite these things together to come up with better textures. So the requirements here are that uh, our textures are going to be 
pseudo random. I say pseudo because you're going to generate a random seed and then you're going to keep it because what you don't want is like every time you render the frame, it looks different. That would be, that'd be problematic. Um, it'll work in any uh, dimension it's going to turn out. Um, four dimensional noise is pretty common for animation. So you have X, Y, Z plus time. Um, and what you're going to get is something that's somehow smooth, but also somehow random and, and uh, doesn't use very much memory. Seems like a lot of different requirements all in one. So let's talk about how you do that. So in one dimension, parallel noise is pretty simple to describe. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to store in 1D at just regular intervals a random number. <laughs> Completely random. Um, usually it's bounded between minus 1 and 1 or, you know, in some reasonable range. And remember that we talked about different bases for splines. And one of them took two points and two slopes, and it gave me a way to fill in the function value in between. Anybody remember what that basis is called? Yeah. Not quite. There's another basis. Nope, there was a third one. Air meat. <laughs> so you guys need to review for your midterm. Yeah. Um, so what Perlin said is, OK, at these regular grid points, I'm going to prescribe the value of my function to always be zero. What's the reason for that? Because I want my noise to just average out to zero function. Okay? Moreover, I'm going to prescribe the slope of these points randomly. So I'm just going to generate them with a random number generator. And in between, I'm going to use our meet spline to interpolate. Right? So for instance, here you can see, you know, I have one slope up here, one slope down there. And I get a nice curve like that. So when I look at this function all the way across the x-axis, it's kind of random, right, because it's generated by these randomly generated slopes, but it averages out to zero because, you know, at least at every grid point, I get back to zero. Does that make sense? So this is exactly what Perlin noise is. I actually store random numbers in a texture map, which are these slopes, and then in between those points, I'm going to interpolate using our meat spline. Cool? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. So, um, like, so here's the clearest example, right? So I, I share the slope, and, and that's a good thing because I want what degree of continuity at this point? Anybody remember? C1, right? They share the slope on the same, both sides. Yeah, great question. Yeah, that's true. This is, it's, it's remarkably hard to draw this stuff in PowerPoint. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right, so what specifies... Um, Perlin noise, well, basically the spacing between these sample points, right, this dx value, uh, and then the gradient at the, the different vertices. In the slides, I work out the formula, but you guys already know the formula because we did our meat spline, so we're going to skip it. Okay, so let's say that I want noise on a three-dimensional cube. How could I do it? Well, we already talked about, like, bilinear interpolation, right? We can do exactly the same thing here, right? I can just do a bunch of 1D Perlin noise, right? So like, let's say that I have some XYZ coordinate in the inside of a box here, right? On every edge on the outside, I can do 1D Perlin noise along that line. Then I can connect these points, do 1D Perlin noise between these two guys, and then connect to go to the middle of the box. And that's exactly what it does, right? So the simplest version of Perlin noise, I have a big cubic lattice worth of slopes that I store, uh, and then I use that to interpolate these just random numbers to the interior of a box. Now, um, yeah, so that, that's basically what's going on in, in, in Perlin noise. This is nothing more than a spline where I have a zero value at every point and a randomly generated slope. Okay. Um, right, and that's it. So, so there, there's sort of a nice way to write down that formula in 3D. I wouldn't bother memorizing it. It's the kind of thing you've got to look up every time you want to use it. And that, that, that's, that's okay. Um, one additional observation that Perlin made, by the way, these are all hacks. This is just a thing that he made up that tends to look nice. You should not think of that as anything more than that. Um, storing a giant three-dimensional grid of random numbers seems like kind of overkill. Um, so what did Perlin do? Well, he said, well, maybe I'll just store like a one-dimensional list of random numbers and then just wrap around it in a funny way. And as long as like the way that I wrap around is kind of sufficiently, 
you know, co-prime with the width of my grid, I'm probably not going to notice that it repeats, right? Um, and indeed, that's, that's, uh, if, if you look and you read the academic paper on this stuff, there's some complicated formula, but all this is saying is like, store a long list of random numbers and wrap around it anytime I get to the end. Yeah. Um, right. So let's uh, talk about why we want to do Perlin noise. So, so hopefully you guys kind of have at least like a rough feeling of what this is. It's like a function that just keeps going back to zero and has randomly generated slope in between the grid points. <coughs> so here's Perlin noise on a sphere. So here it's just like Perlin noise in the xyz coordinates restricted to the surface. And that dx parameter, like the width of that box, in Perlin's language we call that an octave which is probably there's some cute like Pythagorean kind of music story hiding there. Um, but that's roughly like this spacing. I know it's hard to see on the screen. It's kind of purposefully hard to see. So here's what Perlin did. Is he said like, okay, let's say I make Perlin noise at one scale and I make it blue. I make Perlin noise at another scale and make it reddish. Usually the scale is roughly a factor of two off from the last one. And I put them together. He noticed like, oh, well suddenly I'm starting to get kind of an interesting texture, right? Because I have sort of two different frequencies of noise that are interacting in kind of interesting ways. So for example here, um, I think we weighted every, every octave with like 1 over f. So what is that saying? That's saying that like as they get smaller, I'm making the sort of height of that wave a little bit shorter as well. In other words, I've got like one wave and like little wiggly stuff on top of it. Notice this is extremely imprecise language because that's what people use to model stuff in Perlin noise. Um, and it makes really interesting effects. Let's say I wanted to render the moon. <laughs> the typical thing to render in Perlin noise. The moon has a lot of craters. <laughs> okay? So, so, so uh, continuing kind of phenomenologically, like here's our Perlin noise. It's like a little too smooth for the moon. What would happen if I took the absolute value of this function? Well, every time it crosses zero, suddenly it would kind of bump back up again, right? That kind of looks like a crater. So if we put those things together, I get an effect like this. Right? So here all I did was I took the absolute value of the Perlin noise. I call this turbulence because reasons. And what you get is this kind of interesting effect where you can see the boundaries where the Perlin noise is crossing zero because there's a C0 or C1 discontinuity there, right? Like the, the slope kind of changes rapidly. Notice that this is not scientific at all. It's just like different weird ways that you can compose this random noise function with other stuff to get interesting visual effect. And what Perlin notices is that there's just like this huge universe of weird stuff that you can do with this low frequency random function that makes for interesting visual things. So here's another one. So let's say I wanted to make a, I'm tired of the sun, now I want to make it look like a marble. And so maybe like there's a very low frequency component in the x coordinate that's just like going from brown to white. So what could I do? Well, maybe I put it inside of a sine function with like the x-coordinate, right? So like if you see there are these vertical stripes. So if I just had sine of x, I would get like vertical stripes of like black and then white and then black and white. And then I add a little bit of noise in the interior of the sine function just to make some visual interest. And now what I got was a nice shiny marble shape. Again, was this scientific at all? No, but it's a really clever way to generate lots of different textures by just combining noise on different scales. And there's actually cool user interfaces you can download where essentially you just design Perlin noise textures by composing these different octaves together and like sticking them in other functions. And these are procedural shaders, right? Because what you're doing in your shader is you like maybe sample your Perlin value and then you evaluate a function like sine, but you can do that everywhere, right? Like you don't have to do that in a texture. Um, so like here's a bunch of different... Uh, Examples, and, and all of these things are just different functions of these, these low and high frequency noises. So anyway, Perlin, I mean, it was this like really small, totally hacky construction. Um, it led to some really interesting ideas. There's a link, um, which I hope still works, uh, where you can design your own marble uh, texture in, in, in your browser. Or like, if you, for example, if you wanted to make wood, you know, wood is roughly concentric circles, so maybe you, you know, compute R and theta, and then you perturb it a little bit using Perlin noise and so on. These are just phenomenological tricks that, that, that people came up with that actually make really nice texture. And the nice thing is that if I zoom really, really close into this texture, I don't see pixels, right? Because they're, they're being run through some closed form formula, right? That's the procedural aspect here. Or here's yet another one with the corona where I think, um, what did they do? They made sort of a nice gradient from yellow to red, and then they multiplied it by some turbulent Perlin noise, and I think and then they took a black cutout disk 
right? This is the sort of thing that artists do, but it, it's just really procedural shading. Um, and if you poke around on the internet, just search for Perlin noise, you'll see a million examples. Like here's some other fun ones I found online with like fur and uh, you can use it to generate a displacement map if you have like a rocky landscape, for example. Um, the basic idea here is that uh, Perlin noise is, is, is your first example of a shader, right? It's a little program that gets executed every time you draw a pixel. And we're gonna have a lot of those coming up. And they can control the color, the spectral component, roughness, anything you want. And moreover, what we just saw was an example where we layered them together. The amazing thing is that shaders are really complicated. And some of the industry shaders for movie-style scenes can up to be, you know, 10,000 lines of code of just really careful calculations. They're like, you know, computing an integral of your BRDF over some particular thing. And, you know, there's some for loop that's randomly drawing samples and sending the secondary light source and whatever. Um, all of these things happen inside of these little programs. And the beautiful thing is that it fits in yet again with this nice sort of object-oriented setup that we have in our ray tracer. Because what does that outer loop in that ray tracer care? Nothing, right? You just put in the object where the light's coming from and how much and out comes the color and if there's some crazy shader going on behind the scenes, you know, like Mazel Tov, doesn't matter. It's just like sitting in some other piece of hardware somewhere that, that like is, is just is completely ineffective. Okay, so anyway, uh, with that, that's all for today. Thank you for putting up with a very calm lecture. Um, I'll see you guys on Tuesday and um, you know, don't forget your assignments, quiz, all that good stuff.